Good evening and welcome. We said we were going to use every seat tonight, and we did. So welcome to Allowed. Thrilled to see you here. I'm Louise Steinman, the curator of the Allowed series, and you're in for a very special evening tonight. The vigorous response to this program on the Constitution and the presidency affirms what we all know. Erwin Chemerinsky is the person you want to hear about the Constitution and the presidency. And the Allowed series uh, presented by the Library Foundation at the LA Public Library is where you want to come hear about it. So thank you very, very much. We want to be able to continue to respond to issues of vital concern to our democracy on an ongoing basis. And that's why I'm asking you if you're not already a supporter of the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, and I know many of you here in the room are, and thank you so much for your support, um, to please consider becoming a member um, to help make these allowed programs free to the public. And tonight we're live streaming for those who can't be lucky enough in the to be here in the room with us tonight, so we'll have a much wider audience. Um, those of you, as I said, who are members, thank you so much. And I wanted to remind you all of another great way to support the Library Foundation coming up this weekend, a great event you don't want to miss. The Stay Home and Read a Book Ball. You don't have to go anywhere. You can stay in your pajamas <laughs> and read your favorite book with your favorite intoxicant, with your favorite toys, animals, people around you. So please um, take advantage and help keep Aloud alive. We really, really appreciate your support. Um, the founding dean and professor of First Amendment law at UC Irvine, Erwin Chemerinsky, is one of our country's leading constitutional scholars. He's the author of 10 books, including The Case Against the Supreme Court, and two books to be published this year, Closing the Courthouse Doors, How Your Constitutional Rights Became Unenforceable, and Free Speech on Campus with Howard Gilman. He's also the author of more than 200 law review articles, and I'm sure since I wrote that, there probably have been a dozen more. So, Irwin has argued several cases before the Supreme Court and various circuits of the United States Court of Appeals. And on January 23rd, as I'm sure many of you in this room know, he was one of several lawyers to file a lawsuit against President Donald Trump for violating the emoluments clause of the Constitution. I'm sure that Erwin will tell us tonight about that case, and he'll also be glad to answer your questions during our Q&A. We'll ask for you to wait for the microphone as we do record for podcasts. But before that, we have a great treat. Erwin will be in conversation with another great friend, another great defender of the First Amendment, um, friend of the Library Foundation, veteran journalist, author, and teacher, Jim Newton. From 2007 to 2010, Jim was the editor of the Los Angeles Times editorial pages, where he also worked for 25 years as a reporter, bureau chief, and columnist. He's now the editor-in-chief of a fantastic magazine, Blueprint, which addresses policy changes facing California and LA in particular. He's the author of several biographies, all acclaimed, Earl Warren on Dwight Eisenhower and on Leon Panetta, and he's currently at work on his fourth book, titled Jerry Brown and the Creation of Modern California. So I know you're eager to hear what they have to say. Please join me in giving a big hand for Erwin Chemerinsky and Jim Newton. Thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Louise, and uh, everyone associated with Aloud uh, for this important series. Uh, and especially for tonight's uh, conversation. Uh, I am always uh, happy to be part of these evenings, uh, and that's especially true uh, tonight, as I have the pleasure and honor of sharing the stage with my dear friend, uh, Erwin Chemerinsky. Uh, those of you who have uh, read or uh, heard Erwin before uh, uh, already know what the rest of you are about to discover, that there is um, no uh, smarter or more generous person uh, on the planet. Uh, I am proud to be his friend. I've long uh, been his admirer, uh, and I'm delighted to be with him and you tonight. Thank you, Erwin. Um, so to begin, I warned you I would do this. Um, hypothetical. <laughs> it's the height of World War II, and fascist dictators control Europe from the rock of Gibraltar to suburbs of Leningrad. The American public is understandably frightened at the possibility of espionage or sabotage. Under those circumstances, would it be constitutional for the president to temporarily halt immigration from Europe? The answer is no, 
But before I explain, I want to say what a tremendous pleasure to be with you, Jim, and to be here. Um, but now let me answer your question directly. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Um, I think one of the most basic principles of the Constitution is that we can never assume that somebody is more dangerous because of his or her race or religion or national origin. In fact, I think one of the lessons that we should draw from the Japanese internment during World War II of how wrong it is to assume that a group of people are more dangerous just because of ethnicity. The Supreme Court very tragically upheld that in Korematsu versus United States in 1944. And there's very few decisions of the Supreme Court that are more universally rebuked than that case. Why? Because it's wrong to presume that a person is more dangerous on the basis of race or national origin. We can certainly do screening in an individual basis to assess danger. Mm -hmm. In World War II, England did not intern Germans who were there. England did an individualized screening to see who was dangerous. Mm -hmm. This country didn't, and we should regret it. And so I think we can do screening in World War II or now. We do screening now of refugees, but you can't assume that people are dangerous just on account of national origin or race. Mm -hmm. And what about the obverse? What, take my hypothetical one case further and imagine that there are uh, established limits for immigration from various European countries. Would an exemption from those limits for Jews, say, who were persecuted during the war, would that be constitutionally justified? Yes, because that's very different. That's not assuming that somebody is dangerous on a kind of race. Mm -hmm. That's saying there's a particular group that uniquely faces persecution and we should help them. I think it's disgraceful that our country has not done more to help the Syrian refugees. Right. Out of five million Syrian refugees, we've taken about 15,000. That's helping people who need assistance. And we should be ashamed as a country that we turned away boatloads of Jews and sent them back yeah. to be killed in concentration camps. OK, enough of the hypothetical. Let's move to the moment, uh, the scandal, today's scandal. I'm sure there'll be one tomorrow. Um, <laughs> As you know, uh, as we were talking about at dinner, Jeff, Jeff Sessions uh, testified uh, before the Senate uh, under oath that he had had uh, no contact uh, with Russian officials during the campaign. That turns out to be just flat false. Uh, he met now, as we now know, as he now acknowledges, he met twice with the Russian ambassador. Um, is recusal, and now he's announced as, as of this afternoon that he will recuse himself from any campaign-related investigation that the Justice Department undertakes. Is that enough? Does that cure the problems that he's created? No, because there's now the question of is, did he violate federal statutes by lying before Congress? He was under oath, and he apparently lied. There's sure also like a it. statute yeah. that says that it is a crime to lie before Congress. And it's interesting, the general perjury statute isn't enough. Congress is so concerned with making sure that he would get truthful testimony, there's a specific statute just about that. If you read Senator hmm. Al Franken's question, and you read his answer, it seems pretty clear in light of the revelations of the last day, he lied. So my hope is that career Justice Department officials, if not an independent counsel, will have an investigation and a possible criminal prosecution. Um, there's precedent for that. You might remember when Richard Kleinings was nominated to be Attorney General, now 40 years ago. Turned out he lied and then was forced out and then was criminally prosecuted. He was prosecuted for it. Yeah, and convicted. Know. Is that right? For lying before Congress in his confirmation <laughs> hearing to be Attorney General. And this is going to be a sort of an esoteric constitutional question, but that's what you're here for. Um, uh, the, there is, as, as you know better than anyone, uh, a speech and debate clause uh, that protects speech in the Senate by senators, uh, protects them from prosecution. Sessions was, in fact, a sitting member of the Senate when he testified. Now, granted, the speech and debate clause it doesn't seem to anticipate uh, hearings, uh, confirmation hearings, but would that give him any protection from the, from the course that you're describing there? I don't know of any case where that's ever been litigated. Uh -huh. Now, I would say there's a distinction between what he says in his role as senator and what he says in his role as nominee uh -huh. for attorney general. Uh -huh. Anything he says is senator in a committee on the floor of the Senate cannot be the basis of criminal prosecution or civil suit. But I think it's different when he's testifying in the role of nominee for attorney general. I don't think he should be treated differently than any yeah, other nominee for that position. Just because he's a senator. That's right. Gotcha. Um, we start, started with this hypothetical on, on immigration. Let me come back to it in a more modern uh, context for a minute. Uh, Trump has said he will reissue this order. He said the first one is fine, but 
a lot of people think it isn't. Um, including a federal court of appeal. Including the federal court of appeal, right. right. Well-placed people think it isn't. Um, it, can you imagine um, any way that, that he could redraft this order to achieve what appears to be his objective, which is to severely limit Muslim immigration into this country, that would be constitutional? Is it, I mean, I'm not asking you to give him legal advice, and I'm probably pretty sure he wouldn't take it anyway. But, uh, but it, it, if that's the goal, is there any constitutional way to get there? If the goal is a Muslim ban, no, I don't think there's any way to get there. That one of the things that the Federal Court of Appeals said just a few weeks ago today was that it seemed clear that the initial executive order issued on January 27th was meant to be a Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. He designated seven majority Muslim countries. President Trump the same day went on the Christian Broadcasting Company said, but we'll give exemptions for minority religions in those countries, including mm -hmm. Christians. Rudy Giuliani went on Fox News and said, I was responsible for drafting this, and I wanted to come up with a Muslim ban that could get through the courts. <laughs> a Muslim ban is unconstitutional. It's religious discrimination. It also violates the principle I said to you at the beginning. It's wrong to presume that somebody is more dangerous just on account of his or her religion. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, I think there could be an executive order that greatly restricts immigration that would be constitutional. Now, to begin with, it would need to allow those of the lawful right to be in the country no, to get here, green card holders and those with valid visas. Mm -hmm. I think whatever the new executive order does, it will correct that problem from the prior because executive they, order. And they basically backed off that in yes. practice once they were challenged, right? <clears throat> but apparently, depending on the account you read, it wasn't a mistake that at least uh -huh. some really wanted to keep even those with green cards or valid visas from coming back into the country. I think also if they simply reduce the number of people who can come in, where they create a moratorium on refugees from all countries, I think it would be undesirable, but I think it would be constitutional. Mm -hmm. The more it looks like it's trying to be a Muslim ban, I think the more the courts are going to strike it down and say, that's religious discrimination that violates the First Amendment. And in litigating that question, are its statements by Giuliani, uh, Trump's campaign statements, are those admissible against them in this? The Ninth Circuit explicitly referred to them, mm -hmm. and that's because the motive of the government matters. If the government acts with the motive of discriminating on the basis of religion, that violates the Constitution. And it's not coincidence that these were seven majority Muslim countries, and none other than the president says, but we'll let Christians in from those nations. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Um, Louise mentioned in introducing uh, the two of us uh, your lawsuit on the emoluments clause. Uh, aside from the fact that you forced me to learn what emoluments means, um, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me just read uh, the clause in its entirety and then just ask you a couple questions about it. It says, no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept any present emolument, office, or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. Um, all right, so to basics here, what constitutes an emolument under that language? I think until several weeks ago, most people thought emoluments were skin cream. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> I'd be among them. <laughs> emoluments means benefits. In the language you read, it says no presence or emoluments mm -hmm. from a foreign state. If you go back and look at the history of this at the Constitutional Convention, those who drafted the Constitution were very afraid of the influence of foreign governments on the new nation. There's another provision in the Constitution that says the president has to be a natural born citizen. I think it's a very offensive provision, but I think it was again about trying to limit the influence of foreign governments in the fledgling nation. Mm -hmm. Emoluments means benefits. And any time the president is receiving benefits from foreign governments, that violates this provision. Now, what you read is found in Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution. There's another provision that uses the word emoluments that's also involved in this lawsuit. It says the president of the United States can receive no emoluments from the federal government other than a salary. In other words, no benefits from the federal government other than a salary. I think that was meant to have protection against the president using his or her office to benefit himself or herself. Right, sure. Well, Donald Trump, in his own name, owns buildings where they're renting space to the federal government. He's getting those profits. And so it's the clause that you mentioned, as well as the one that I'm mentioning, the so-called domestic emoluments clause, mm -hmm. that are both at issue in this lawsuit that was filed on January 23rd. And what, well, first of all, actually, let me ask one other question and then come sure. to, to some analysis of it. Um, 
how do you address this question of standing uh, in this case? As, as you all know, and you know, everyone else may better than me, but one has to be damaged in some way uh, in order to bring a case. How is it, who's, who's being harmed by this, and therefore who has standing to, to sue? The plaintiff in the lawsuit is an organization in Washington called Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. And the basis for their standing is a 1982 Supreme Court case, Havens Realty versus Coleman. That was a case actually about housing discrimination. The Supreme Court said that a public interest organization, a not-for-profit, has standing to challenge illegal practices if you can show that those illegal practices changed the priorities, distorted the activities of the organization. And what huh. Crewe alleges in detail in his complaint is the way in which the unconstitutional practices of the president have distorted its activities, changed huh. its priorities, and thus it fits right within this case. Huh. Now, I think it would be important down the road, though I think we have a strong argument for standing, to see if we can find other plaintiffs, maybe a competitor hotel, maybe a union from a competitor hotel, maybe members of Congress, maybe state attorney generals. But I think even without that, we have a Supreme Court case and precedents from the uh -huh. United States Court of Appeals from the Second Circuit that would indicate standing exists here. And when will that, I assume that'll be decided as a preliminary matter before going forward. How, how does that proceed? I expect that Donald Trump, who is the named defendant in this lawsuit, will move to dismiss for lack of standing. My guess he'll also say this is a political question that's not susceptible to judicial resolution and that there'll be briefing on those questions and then assuming we prevail, then the court would get to the merits. Gotcha. And I think the merits are clear, let me say. I mean, uh -huh. the evidence is overwhelming that literally every day Donald Trump is benefiting from foreign governments and from the federal government. To take just one example, Trump International Hotel is on the site of the old post office in Washington, D.C. Donald Trump, in his own name, owns 76% of the interest in that hotel. His children own the other 24% in their own names. We now know of instances of foreign governments renting facilities, ballrooms, hotel rooms, that they used to rent from other competitor hotels. Mm -hmm. And he's profiting from that. That's an emolument. And he doesn't even have to ask for it. I mean, that's partly what's so pernicious about this, right, is that if you wanted to curry favor with him, you don't ask, you'd ask his permission, you could just rent a hotel room. And this is one hotel in one city. Mm -hmm. If you think of all of the Trump properties that are benefiting from foreign governments, that's unconstitutional. If you think about his property that's leasing space to the federal government and he's profiting, that violates the domestic emoluments clause. Right. Um, what remedy, if any, would there be for him other than selling the company outright? Is there anything he could do to ameliorate this? The complaint filed in federal court on January 23rd asks for two remedies. One is a declaratory judgment, which is a declaration from the court that he is violating the Constitution. And I think that's important in itself. The other is injunctive relief to force him to comply with the Constitution. And I think there are a number of ways he could do that. He could sell all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, he could choose not to accept foreign business at any of these hotels. Oh, interesting, right. And I think an interesting question is whether if he truly put this in a blind trust, we played no role in managing, no role in even knowing who was the owner, if it was sold, whether that would be sufficient. And I can see arguments either way with mm -hmm. regard to that. Because even if it's in a blind trust, he'd still be the one drawing the benefits and the yeah. emoluments. And it's, the, it's hard to put a real estate property into a blind trust, right. too, right? When it's called Trump International Hotel. Right, right. It's pretty obvious who owns right. it. Right? Um, so I'm skeptical of the blind trust. Uh -huh. But ultimately, I think the question of remedy is for President Trump to answer. Uh -huh. There's no exception to the emoluments clause that says, well, except if it's expensive to the office holder. Uh -huh. I got asked a lot when the lawsuit was filed, why was I doing this? I think the answer is one of the most basic aspects of the rule of law is that no one, not even the president, is above the law. Mm -hmm. This is about ensuring that the president complies with the Constitution, even if it's expensive to do that. Mm -hmm. Is there, and I should know the answer to this having written a, a book on the court, um, but is there any um, vehicle for punishing a president other than impeachment or removal? Could it be fined? Could it be, or is that the only avenue that's available? A president cannot be civilly sued for money damages for anything done while in office. That was the holding of a Supreme Court case in 1982, Nixon versus Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. A president, though, can be sued for an injunction or declaratory judgment. It, 
appears the consensus of opinion is a president cannot be criminally prosecuted while in office. There's no case holding that, but you might remember that on March 1st, 1974, the Watergate grand jury named Richard Nixon an unindicted co-conspirator because mm -hmm. they didn't think they could indict a sitting president. I see. So what can be done against a president short of impeachment is quite limited. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the case of Clinton, the Paula Jones civil case, obviously, uh, memorably came to fruition during his presidency, even though he tried to have it delayed until after his presidency, right? And the reason there was was for actions that occurred prior Before. to taking Got office. It. And in fact, the Supreme Court, in a case called Clinton versus Jones in 1997, said that whereas a president cannot be civilly sued for anything done while in office, even oh. after he's out of office, a oh. president has no immunity for acts that occurred prior, prior. to taking office. Uh -huh. And so Donald Trump can still be sued, say, for anything from Trump University or anything that occurred prior to taking office. Right. I think still can be sued for anything he's doing with his businesses today, but he cannot be civilly sued for money damages for anything he does in carrying out the presidency. Interesting. And, and would that intersect with your lawsuit at all then? I mean, he, he's in violation of the emoluments clause to the degree that he is only once he becomes president, I assume. We don't seek money damages. Uh -huh. I think money damages are what's limited against a president with taking office. So you can sue a president for what's done in office for an injunction to Got stop it. it, for a declaratory judgment, but not for money damages. But you can sue for money damages for anything that occurred prior to taking office, that's Clinton versus Jones. Gotcha. Um, let's shift to this court for a minute. Um, when uh, Judge Gorsuch was nominated, there was a sort of uh, odd sort of sigh of relief, I think, in a lot of quarters that, the, that there was a, that, there, he's, that Trump's incapable of naming a kind of mainstream conservative. Um, I wonder if you share that view that Gorsuch is within the kind of normal range, and obviously he's more conservative, uh, I'm sure, than a justice you would prefer, but do you consider him a mainstream conservative, or is, should we think of him as a, as a fringe figure? <clears throat> it depends on how you regarded Robert Bork in 1987. <laughs> I, I suspect the audience consensus is pretty strong. <laughs> um, in 1987, the Senate rejected Robert Bork because of his so-called originalist way of interpreting the Constitution. <laughs> Robert Bork said that the meaning of a constitutional provision is the same today as when it was adopted. So Bork explicitly said there's no protection of privacy rights under the Constitution, including reproductive freedom. Bork said there's no protection for women against discrimination under equal protection, because that wasn't what the framers of the 14th Amendment had in mind. Those were the same views that Antonin Scalia had. Neil Gorsuch is a self-avowed originalist. So I think if you regard Robert Bork out of the judicial mainstream, hmm. so is Neil Gorsuch. The difference is the Democrats controlled the Senate in September of 1987. Mm -hmm. The Republicans control the Senate today. So I don't think it's the views that are different. It's the political landscape uh -huh. that's so different. Right. And does it, how much does it matter that he would be replacing Scalia? And I mean, it's not really possible to be more of an originalist than Scalia, presumably, right? So are we just trading kind of one originalist for an older one for a younger one? I think it restores the ideological balance to what it was before Justice Scalia died on February 13th, 2016. Now, the Democrats, painfully aware of this being, in their view, a stolen seat, mm -hmm. had Merrick Garland been confirmed, it would have been five justices who were appointed by Democratic presidents. And what happened to Merrick Garland is unprecedented. Yeah, 24 times in American history before 2016, there had been a vacancy in the last year of a president's term. In 21 of 24, the Senate confirmed. In three, the Senate denied confirmation. But never had the Senate said, we won't hold hearings, we won't hold a vote at all. So I think the Democrats are very aware of that as they approach the Gorsuch hearings. Also, Neil Gorsuch is 49 years old. If he remains on the Supreme Court until he's 90, the age with Justice John Paul Stevens stepped down, he'll be a Supreme Court justice for 41 years. Or as I said to my students, he'll be a Supreme Court justice the year 2058, and I asked them to think about how much of their lives and their career they'll be a Justice Gorsuch. Yeah, amazing. Um, and of course, if, uh, if uh, we face the possibility that another justice or two could leave, uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, being the one I think that most people have an eye on, um, just because of her age, um, there could be really a profound change uh, in the court if that were to occur. You're right. I mean, as we were just saying, replacing Justice Scalia with a Justice Gorsuch doesn't change the ideological balance from what it was before Justice Scalia's death. 
but replacing Justice Ginsburg or Justice Kennedy or Justice Breyer will dramatically change the ideological balance of the court. And are they the three oldest justices? Yes. Since 1960, 78 years old is the average age which Supreme Court justice has left the bench. Ruth <laughs> Bader Ginsburg turns 84 on March 15th, two weeks from yesterday. <laughs> Anthony Kennedy will turn 81 on July 23rd. And Stephen Breyer will turn 79 on August 15th. How likely is it that all three of them will still be on the court on January 20th 2021, assuming Trump is a one-term president. Mm -hmm. And to make this concrete rather than abstract, I think then there will be five votes to overrule Roe versus Wade. I think there'll be five votes to eliminate all affirmative action, five yeah. votes to eliminate the exclusionary rule in criminal cases. If one of these three justices is replaced by President Trump, it will be the most conservative court there's been since the mid-1930s. In fact, that was actually, you've anticipated my next question. I was going to ask you to compare this court historically uh, assuming either a Scalia or a Gorsuch uh, in that seat, uh, with courts, uh, other courts in American history, this would rank, in your view, as one of the most conservative courts already? Well, it's already a very <clears throat> conservative court, and it's interesting because it's happened gradually, and it's not in every decision. We tend to forget how much the Supreme Court has steadily moved to the right over, say, the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Lewis Powell, for a time, was the swing justice on the court. He then was replaced by Sandra O'Connor as the swing justice, and she was more conservative than he was. She was then replaced by Anthony Kennedy as the swing justice, and in many areas, he's more conservative than Sandra O'Connor. Mm -hmm. If we have Gorsuch and another Trump nominee, then the swing justice is so much further to the right than a Kennedy or an O'Connor or a Powell. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to turn to all of you for questions in a minute, so be getting ready. We'll pass a microphone, but let me ask you just a couple more. Sure. Um, what do you make of Trump's, such his visceral relationship with so much of the press? I mean, I, uh, I regret, of course, that there's no law against treating reporters badly, but, um, but it seems so uh, com un uh, unimaginably uh, um, uh, volatile. Uh, does, are there, what are the implications for society, the Constitution, um, government generally, in that kind of relationship, assuming that it keeps on? There are only three checks on a president. Congress, and thus far this Congress has shown no willingness or inclination to be a check on the president. Look at the votes in the Senate on Trump's nominations for the cabinet. I can only think of one instance where two Republicans voted against somebody. Otherwise, no matter how extreme the individual was, whether it's Jeff Sessions or Scott Pruitt for EPA, the Republicans voted in lockstep. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, if it's not Congress to check, then it's the courts or the press. I cannot think of any others. Well, when it comes to the press, I think that President Trump has really tried to undermine the legitimacy of the press. I think his statements at that press conference, we talked about, quote, the press being out of control, the press being the largest problem facing the nation. His tweet the next day saying, the press is an enemy of the people, his campaign against fake news. I think that's about undermining the legitimacy, one of the few checks that exists on the president. And of course, he's tried to do the same thing to the court. When a federal district court judge up in Seattle, Washington, issued a temporary restraining order against his executive order on immigration, he referred to it as a so-called judge. Um, he referred to the United States Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit saying they didn't understand what even high school students would understand. And so I worry that one of the things that's happening is President Trump trying to undermine the legitimacy of the very few checks that exist with regard to the presidency. And do you see any indication that that would change? On the part of President Trump? <laughs> Fair question. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, well, both. I answer the question both ways, whether he would change it all or whether this, this balance, whether the, 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 any way that we could see more uh, aggressive or effective uh, accountability emanating from elsewhere. As you know, most presidents develop a more adversarial relationship with the press as their term goes on. And that's understandable. <laughs> kind of hard to imagine. <laughs> What's unique about this is a president who began with such an adversarial relationship with the press. The press is going to be reporting on the problems in the Trump administration. And I think his response to that is going to be very defensive and attack the press. Mm -hmm. um, and again, to me, what matters so much is we have so few ways of checking any president 
if the press isn't going to perform that function, and if the courts aren't going to perform that function, then there is really nothing. Yeah. It's hard to imagine a president angrier about winning. Um, I mean, imagine if he'd lost. <laughs> I mean, he, he does seem so consumed by anger. And it may be that the person who should be sitting here is a psychologist <laughs> rather than a constitutional law I'm sure that'll be coming up soon. Um, last thing for me, uh, and then we'll uh, go to all of you. A lot of talk in Sacramento, uh, and I've been uh, spending time actually talking with the governor and others, about resistance uh, to all of this, whether it's climate change or immigration or sanctuary cities, et cetera. Um, I guess my question, two questions. How much power does Trump really have to deliver on his promise to cut funding to UC or to strip funding from so-called sanctuary cities? Um, and, and on the flip side, how much latitude do you see the governor and legislature and mayors out here who, who seek to resist, how much uh, latitude do they have to do so? Context is going to matter a great deal. The Supreme Court has said that Congress cannot commandeer or coerce state and local governments. So there's a Supreme Court case in 1997, Prince versus the United States, involved a provision of the Brady Handgun Control Act. It said that state and local law enforcement personnel had to do background checks for furnishing permits for firearms. The Supreme Court declared that unconstitutional in an opinion by Justice Scalia. The court said Congress cannot force local governments to be arms of the federal government enforcement agents. And when the Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Care Act, it nonetheless, seven to two, struck down Medicaid provisions. They said that any state receiving federal Medicaid money had to provide coverage to those within 133% of federal poverty level. The federal government paid 100% of the cost in 2019 and 90% thereafter. The Supreme Court said this is unconstitutional coercion of state and local governments. So using those precedents, I think what the federal government can do to commandeer state and local governments is limited. Mm -hmm. Now let me take on the two examples you mentioned because they're quite different. One is with regard to so-called sanctuary cities. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to be careful here because I think sanctuary is a misnomer. It's not like when religious institutions are sanctuaries where they're hiding people. Mm -hmm. Sanctuary cities simply mean they don't want to affirmatively cooperate with federal immigration officials. Why might they do that? Well, police departments are afraid that they turn people over to immigration officials, victims of crime and witness of crime won't come forward. That's why the LAPD has had a rule since 1979 limiting its cooperation with immigration officials. Drafted by no, no. Daryl Gates. Daryl Gates of all people, yeah. <clears throat> Public hospitals are afraid that sick people, including with communicable diseases, won't come in for treatment. Mm -hmm. School systems are afraid that parents won't send their children to schools if they face deportation. Donald Trump's executive order that was issued on January 26th said that the federal government would cut off funds to local governments that are so-called sanctuary cities. I think that's unconstitutional based on the precedents I said because it's coercion. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court has said Congress can't use strings on grants in a way to coerce state and local governments. Mm -hmm. Now, your other example was with regard to pollution control. And the law here has been that state and local governments can set stricter environmental standards than federal law unless Congress prohibits that. So California can have stricter air quality standards or water quality standards than federal law unless Congress prohibits that. But if Congress wants to say that state and local governments can't do that, then Congress can say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, under the Clean Air Act, if I'm not mistaken, there's specifically a waiver process for California, right? And I, if I, uh, the new EPA chief has said he, he will not commit to granting that waiver. Right. At the hearing, and it, it, there have been different waivers given to California for a long period of time um, for things like car emissions. Mm -hmm. It would be a major change in the law to say that California no longer could have stricter environmental standards. But Scott Pruitt at his hearing said exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, and if the federal government wants to keep California from doing that, the federal government can do so. Mm -hmm. and, what would be the analog? My recollection is that um, I think it was during the Carter years that federal uh, transportation funding uh, depend, required states to lower the speed limit to 55. Is that not analogous to this? Sure. <clears throat> and an even better example is Congress passed a law that said that any state receiving federal highway money had to set a 20 year old drinking age. Huh. And that was challenged as being unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court said it was permissible because it met three criteria. First, the conditions were clearly stated. Second, the conditions related to the purpose of the program. Mm -hmm. And third, the conditions were not unduly coercive. A state would lose only 5% of its federal highway money. Oh, I see. So if you're asking when can the Trump administration 
threatened to take away money or set conditions. It has to be clearly stated mm -hmm. as related to the purpose of the program, and it can't be unduly coercive. Mm -hmm. And I think the executive order from January 25th fails all three of those requirements. Gotcha. And, and any such action would require Congress's participation, too. That's right. It's Congress that has to set strings on grants. So if I can mention another example, there was an incident several weeks ago where the chancellor at Berkeley canceled an appearance of Milo Yiannopoulos because of a threat to public safety. And the next day, President Trump said, we should cut off all of the money to Berkeley for uh -huh. not allowing free speech. <laughs> First, it ignored the context of the threat to public safety. But second, the president doesn't have that authority. Only Congress can put strings on grants. They have to be clearly stated, relate mm -hmm. to the purpose of the program, and there still cannot be undue coercion. And, and I presume we're moving forward, too, right? Not retroactively. Uh, I mean, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> it would, if Congress wanted to say that any public university that's deemed to violate freedom of speech will lose this much federal funds, I think Congress could do that, but it would have to be prospective. Gotcha. Terrific. All right. Let's uh, give you all an opportunity here, um, and then we may come back and wrap up in a little bit, but uh, someone here has a microphone, I think. I'll let you... I'm wondering what you think about the Muslim ban and whether it would give ISIS and its um, brother institutions just what they've been looking for. That is a reason to uh, recruit more readily, to have the US as an enemy more clearly, and potentially to um, grow homegrown terrorists. Again, I'm a constitutional law professor, not an expert on ISIS. Let me talk about something I do know about by analogy. Um, we know that Guantanamo became a symbol that was used by Al-Qaeda and ISIS to recruit people against the United States. I worry by analogy that the Muslim ban would have exactly that same effect. My main concern, though, as I said to Jim, is that under our Constitution, discriminating against people on account of religion is unconstitutional. And a Muslim ban does that. It's wrong to presume that somebody's more likely to be dangerous just because he or she is a Muslim. I'm worried about whether the Supreme Court, as it may be constituted with the, with the new justice, will um, look at past precedent or make up new precedents as they go along. <laughs> there are long law review articles and even books that have been written about what should be the role of precedent in constitutional law. They all come to exactly the same conclusion. Precedent should be followed except when it should be overruled. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that's right, because there are times that precedent has to be overruled. We all believe Brown versus Board of Education was indispensable, essential, in overruling Plessy versus Ferguson. On the other hand, we also believe that precedent is important for stability in law. If Merrick Garland had replaced Justice Scalia, we'd be having a conversation of, is the Supreme Court now going to overrule Citizens United? Is the Supreme Court going to change the law with regard to the Second Amendment? Well, I think if Neil Gorsuch and another Trump nominee join the court, there's no doubt that certain things conservatives have always wanted to see overruled, like Roe versus Wade, will get overturned. Now, I also have no doubt that on March 20th, when the confirmation hearings begin, Neil Gorsuch is going to say, I believe in precedent. Mm -hmm. But of course he's going to say that at his confirmation hearings. Can I ask you, uh, just to interject sure. one, because I didn't ask you directly before, do you think Gorsuch will be confirmed? I think Gorsuch will be confirmed one way or another. Mm -hmm. I think if the Democrats choose not to filibuster him, there's 52 Republicans, and I think if the Democrats choose to filibuster him, the Republicans will change the Senate rules to eliminate the filibuster for Supreme Court nominations. The filibuster is not provided for in the Constitution. It's provided for by Senate rules. The Senate can change those rules by majority vote. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Democratic Senate changed the rules during the Obama presidency to eliminate the filibuster for federal district court and federal court of appeals judges and cabinet nominations. Mm -hmm. President Trump has already said for the Democrats filibuster, the Republicans just use the so-called nuclear option and eliminate the filibuster. And may I add that having Trump say the words nuclear option has a special ring to it. But, um, <laughs> Uh, all right, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interject there. Who's next? <clears throat> Hi, 
Hi, this might seem like a little bit of a crazy question, but <laughs> it's a crazy time. Um, imagine a scenario that um, an, a, a bunch of justices get re uh, replaced over time, and then there's a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president, but we have this court that's been weighted, in many's view, very unfairly to the right. Um, what do you think about like a new court packing scheme? <laughs> The number of Supreme Court justices is not set in the Constitution. It's set by statute. We've, over the course of American history, gone as few as five and as many as 10. The reason we have nine is in the late 1860s, the Congress didn't want to let Andrew Johnson, the very controversial, inadvertent president, fill a vacancy. So they said, the next time there's a vacancy, we're going to eliminate the seat in the court. And it's been nine ever since the 1860s. We all know that in the 1930s, President Franklin Roosevelt, after winning a landslide re-election in 1936, proposed court packing as a response to the Supreme Court having struck down so many New Deal programs. And it's interesting, even though the Congress, both Senate and House, were overwhelmingly controlled by Democrats, they rejected that idea of court packing. So nine has been fixed since the late 1860s. I think the Democrats would be very reluctant to try to increase the number to get a majority back on the Supreme Court, because then they also know, well, the next time the Republicans take control, they could increase the size, and there's no stopping point to that. But we'll, we'll see where we are then. It's possible. It's all by statute. It's not by the Constitution. And you've talked about term limits. For I have. Um, and I, I wrote about this long before the current vacancy or the current president. Um, some of it is, thankfully, life expectancy is a lot longer today than it was in 1787. Clarence Thomas was 43 years old when he was confirmed for the Supreme Court in 1991. If he remains until he's 90, the age where Justice Stevens stepped down, he'll be a Supreme Court justice for 47 years. John Roberts and Elena Kagan reached 50 when on the court. That's just too much power held by a single individual for too long a period of time. Also. Now too much depends on the accident of history. Richard Nixon got mm -hmm. four vacancies to fill in his first two years as president. Jimmy Carter didn't have any vacancies to fill in his four years as president. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of 18-year non-renewable terms, unless this be thought of as a crazy liberal idea. Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, <laughs> proposed this when he ran for president in 2012. <laughs> I, if you and Rick Perry agree. Um, <laughs> Our new secretary of energy. To be <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. <clears throat> Um, Professor Chmielewski, we're all probably here wondering about your views on the increase of civil disobedience that's arising recently. And you spoke about the three checks uh, on the presidency, Congress, the courts, um, and the media. So I would like to hear what you think about sort of the internal side to the executive branch by the regula regulators now that are speaking up in terms of leaking out information ultimately starting to impact some of the Republican Congress sort of coming in from the back door and how you foresee that impact sort of leading us forward through this sort of uh, new wave of civil disobedience from the grassroots level. Leaks of information have proven to be enormously important in our learning crucial information about our government. The way Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein broke the story of Watergate was because of deep throat. The way we learned of the torture at Abu Ghraib was because of leaks to the media. The way that we learned about the massive illegal eavesdropping by the National Security Administration was because of leaks. The way in which we've learned of the impermissible and I think illegal contacts between members of the soon-to-be Trump administration and the Russian government was because of leaks. But the Trump administration has tools to go over after the leaks that are quite frightening. And unfortunately, the Obama administration used those tools more than any other president in history. For example, the Espionage Act 1918 makes it a federal crime to disclose national security information. There have been 12 prosecutions under that statute in American history. Nine were during the Obama years. The Obama years very aggressively went after reporters force them to disclose their sources. There's no constitutional protection in federal court against a reporter having to disclose sources. And 
Jim, this goes back to your question about the attitude towards the press. Mm -hmm. I think it could take the form of legal actions under the Espionage Act against leakers, forcing reporters to disclose their sources. And that's what I'm afraid we're going to see in the months and years ahead by an administration that's so hostile to the press. You know, there's been a lot of talk, uh, and again, my apologies for jumping back in, but of a Please. federal shield law, uh, which has been considered for years. I assume you would favor it. Does it have any, any chances uh, of prevailing these days? In 1973, in a case called Brandsburg versus Hayes, the Supreme Court ruled that reporters do not have a First Amendment right to keep their sources confidential. Every state has some form of state shield law. California has a shield law, but that operates in state court. Some federal court of appeals have fashioned law a bit better than the Supreme Court, but generally the federal court of appeals have not been good in this regard, and Brandsburg is the precedent. There's been a proposal for a federal shield law going all the way back to 1973. Oh, wow. It's never been enacted, and it then means that the reporter who reveals the leak is vulnerable to being subpoenaed and at penalty of perhaps having to go to prison if he or she doesn't reveal the source. And especially a confusing situation in a place like California where if that same action is brought in state court, a reporter has the ability to decline. It creates, well, as a reporter, it creates a difficult situation, obviously. Right. <clears throat> um, Pete, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Wishful thinking aside, do you think there is a chance that Trump will be impeached before the four-year term? And if so, on what basis? The Constitution says that a president, vice president, federal judge, office of the United States can be impeached and removed from office for treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. There's no legal definition of high crimes and misdemeanors. Bill Clinton learned that in the late 1990s. <laughs> but it's always been thought that high crimes and misdemeanors requires a serious abuse of power. There's a majority Republican control of the House and a majority Republican control of the Senate. That makes it unlikely that you'd be able to get majority of the House, two-thirds of the Senate to impeach and remove. I think it would require an illegal act or some serious abuse of power. I don't think we have anything like that so far, and it's just guessing as to what's going to happen. I mean, you know, we're six weeks, not even six weeks into the Trump presidency. <laughs> so imagine what's going to happen in the next four years. <laughs> When I was in college in the late 60s, I read a book called The Imperial Presidency. By Arthur Schlesinger. Yes. Out of curiosity, with what this administration and the past administration, the Obama administrations, have done with executive order, orders, are we not creating a situation, and is there a check for that in the Constitution to go back to checks and balances? There are two checks with regard to executive orders. One is Congress, by statute, can invalidate any executive order. And an executive order is just an instruction to the executive branch government how to operate in the absence of a statute. The other is, of course, the courts can invalidate an executive order as violating separation of powers or as exceeding statutory authority. When President Obama issued his executive order, Deferred Action for Parents of Americans, a federal district court in Texas issued a nationwide preliminary injunction, and it never went into effect. When President Obama issued an executive order to require that greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants be reduced, the United States Supreme Court stayed it from going into effect. But those are the two checks. I guess there's one other obvious one. The next president can rescind an executive order. Any executive order created by one president can then be rescinded by the next president. But those are the checks with regard to executive orders. Hi. Uh, in the early 1980s, the exclusionary rule was weakened by the good faith exception. Uh, unfortunately, my case. Uh, <laughs> if the exclusionary rule were to be eliminated altogether, what would be left of the Fourth Amendment? Just so that everyone well, you probably already know what we're talking about. The Supreme Court in 1914 said that if a federal law enforcement officer violated the Fourth Amendment with an illegal search or an illegal arrest, any evidence that was gained had to be excluded from coming into court. The Supreme Court said that we need to deter police misconduct, 
so the police and prosecutors shouldn't be able to benefit from the violation of the Constitution. Also, they said the court should not be tainted by having a conviction based on illegally obtained evidence. In 1961, in Matt v. Ohio, the Supreme Court said that the exclusion rule applies if state and local police violate the Constitution. I think there are three votes on the current court to eliminate the exclusion rule, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas and Alito. In fact, in 2006, in a case called Hudson v. Michigan, they joined an opinion written by Justice Scalia calling for the elimination of the exclusionary rule. <laughs> if Judge Gorsuch confirmed takes that view and one other nominee does, then there will be no exclusion of evidence. Well, what's then left to enforce the Fourth Amendment? In theory, police officers can be civilly sued for money damages if they violate the Fourth Amendment, but the Supreme Court a whole series of doctrines has made it almost impossible to civilly sue police officers for violating the Fourth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment will still be there, but there won't be any remedy when the police violate it. Hi. Um, what do you think, so when regular citizens even incite um, you know, a ruckus, right, when they get together and they're on the speakerphone and they get people riled up, they are always arrested, especially when it's after, you know, a protest or a movement, what can be done to hold the president accountable for inciting moral panic? Because when every other citizen does that, there's accountability, but he's doing that before the presidency, during the election, and now he's even going as far as to saying things that he can't even do as a president. You know, how can we hold him accountable to that legally? I think this goes back to the questions that Jim asked. When it comes to holding a president accountable, there's Congress that can do so. This Congress doesn't seem inclined. There's the press that can report his misconduct and have public pressure hopefully change the conduct. And if he violates the law or the Constitution, there's a court that can stop him from doing so. But those are really the only checks that exist against the president. And it's why it concerns me so much that President Trump, in just his few weeks of office, is trying so hard to undermine the legitimacy of the courts and of the press. Are there any legal tools or strategies that could have been or could be used to prevent a foreign government from interfering in a United States election, and also any legal tools and strategies to prevent our government from interfering in other countries' elections? In terms of the latter, we know of instances in which our government has tried, especially the CIA, to influence foreign elections or even help stage coups in foreign governments. So, I mean, now there are laws that have sometimes been put into place that limit our ability to do that, but it has happened in the past. Um, but as to the former question, there is no way of changing the outcome of the November 2016 election. <laughs> I've gotten so many emails from people say, if it's proven that Russia exercised influence over the outcome, isn't that a basis for invalidating the election? And the answer is no. The only way you can remove a president is through the impeachment process. There's also the 25th Amendment of the vice president, the majority of the cabinet, deeming the president to be incompetent. But then the president can reassert power and it goes to Congress. But that's it. We don't have a vote of no confidence. We don't have any mechanism by which, even if the election was tainted, to overturn its results. What about if the, if the Clinton campaign had a few good points and they got on the bus to say they were threatening the president? Could they have done something at, at the time? Are there any ways that they could have? No. What they could have done was expose it to the public and hope that public pressure might have mattered, that it might have had an effect on enough voters to tip the election. But, um, you know, how do you, you could sue the Russian government, but for what? <laughs> this is probably not a constitutional question. Then it goes to Jim. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm sitting here saying, you know, the U.S., most of us live in places where we can find jobs and the Electoral College is set up in a way that we kind of lost it this last time because we didn't count very well. And is there any way we can think about the Electoral College in a way 
that it would be more meaningful to the way the U.S. perhaps ought to work because we're trying to be together as opposed to places where there sort of aren't any people and they're feeling really bad. I understand that, but can you help with that? <laughs> Let me speak to the constitutional issues concerning the Electoral College. Um, Jim is the most astute political observer I know, so he might have far better insights than I do on the political issues. Um, I think the candidate who wins the popular vote should be the President of the United States. <laughs> I think that there's two different issues with regard to Electoral College, one of which seems insoluble to me and the other of which I do see a solution for. it. The one that's insoluble is that the Constitution says that every state gets the number of electors equal to the number of its senators and representatives. That then means that small states are guaranteed three votes in the Electoral College. It means that a vote in Wyoming has three times more effect in the Electoral College than a vote in California. Yeah. I think it is highly unlikely that any court will declare a part of the Constitution that's been followed since 1787 to be unconstitutional. I can develop a legal theory for it and say, well, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments create a requirement for equal protection. The amendments modify the text. It violates one, one person, one vote. And so we should see the amendments as overruling the text. I don't think the court's going to go there. And I don't see a constitutional amendment to change the Electoral College because it takes three quarters of the states to approve a constitutional amendment, and all the small states that benefit from the Electoral College aren't going to change it. But there is a second dimension to the Electoral College that can be changed, and that's 48 of 50 states, all but Maine and Nebraska, use winner-take-all with regard to the Electoral College. So if a candidate wins just over 50% of the popular vote, the candidate in every state but Maine and Nebraska gets 100% electoral votes. If you voted for Donald Trump in California, your vote is meaningless for the Electoral College because Hillary Clinton got 100% electoral votes. If you voted for Hillary Clinton in Texas, your vote is meaningless because Donald Trump got 100% electoral votes. I think there's a strong argument that that's unconstitutional. Winner take all is not provided for in the Constitution. It's provided for in the laws of 48 states. And I think if we would just have proportional allocation of electors, make it highly unlikely for you to somebody win the popular vote but lose an electoral college. Wouldn't, uh, don't some of the same arguments that raise questions about the fairness of the electoral college apply to the Senate itself? It does, though again, it's the Constitution that says that every state will have two senators. And I think it'd be hard to say that's unconstitutional. That was such an integral part of the compromise that gave rise to the Constitution because the small states wanted to make sure that they had equal representation in Congress. The large states wanted allocation of representatives based on population, so they created the House and the Senate as a compromise. No courts can ever declare that unconstitutional. Right. I think no court's going to declare the Electoral College unconstitutional, but I think they could declare statutes that provide for winner-take-all to be unconstitutional. Okay. Any time in history, when uh, the Supreme Court was, um, was not so predictable. Of course, the Supreme Court is predictable on some issues, at times unpredictable on others, but all through American history, the ideology of the justices has determined what the Supreme Court has done. And there's reasons for that. The Constitution is written in very broad, open-ended language. What's due process of law? What's equal protection? And the values of the justices determine the meaning they give to that language in the Constitution. Also, almost every constitutional case involves balancing of competing interests. How the balancing is done is very much a function of who's on the court. Now, we're at an unusual time in that all four of the conservative justices were appointed by Republican presidents, and all four of the more liberal justices were appointed by Democratic presidents. That's unusual in American history. In fact, until relatively recently, we had Republican nominees who were liberal. John Paul Stevens was appointed by Gerald Ford. David Souter was appointed by President George H.W. Bush. 
We had Democrats who were conservative. Byron White, Felix Frankfurter. I think now it appears more ideological because of the correspondence between the president who appointed the justices and their ideology. There have been times when we've had more middle of the road justice than we do today, and the more we have moderates on the court, then to use your words, the more unpredictable the court would be. But it's not just now that the court's determined what it does by the ideology of justices. That's been true going back to the earliest days of American history. Yeah, the other thing that's changed, at least since the Warren Court, um, is the justices now are all really professional judges uh, before right. they became justices, where there used to be a much bigger range of experience. Do you think that's changed the way the court looks at certain issues? I think so. I think when Brown versus Board of Education was decided in 1954, none of the nine justices had been federal court of appeals judges. Right. And most had not been judges at all. Right. <clears throat> Earl Warren, who you had right. a wonderful biography of, had been governor of California, attorney general of California. Felix Frankfurt went from being a Harvard Law professor. William Douglas from being a commissioner on the Security and Exchange Commission. Hugo Black from being a senator from Alabama. Mm -hmm. On the current court, seven of the eight justices were federal court of appeals judges before going on the court. Elena Kagan had never been a judge. She was solicitor right. general. And Neil Gorsuch is a judge for the last 10 years on the 10th Circuit. I think that there is a benefit of having a greater diversity of experience on the court. Mm -hmm. There is something very humbling in running for election. Um, as you know, I ran for election once for the city charter commission. I even you doing that, <laughs> was a, uh, even um. doing that was a very humbling experience to have to go before voters. I remember the morning of the election saying to my wife, "I don't know if I'm going to get two votes today." And she said, "Why are you so presumptuous and think you're going to get a second <laughs> vote?" That's a true conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that it's important to have Supreme Court justices who stood before the voters, um, who served in the legislative process. Sandy O'Connor was the last justice who did that. I think we have one more. Please. Yes, I have two short questions. What's, what, <laughs> what, what's your stance of the Senate invoking the nuclear option if Gorsuch uh, can't get past the filibuster. And secondly, what's your sense of, of John Roberts as an activist uh, Supreme uh, Chief Justice, particularly in light of his testimony before the Senate the Judiciary Committee where he promised to follow the law, respect the precedents, and all the usual kinds of testimony? I'm going to break that down into three parts. <laughs> First, in terms of the nuclear option, I think, as I said to Jim, if the Democrats filibuster, the Republicans will change the Senate rules to eliminate the filibuster for Supreme Court nominations. I think the question the Democrats have to face is, should they go ahead and fight hard here anyway? Because either way, Neil Gorsuch is on the Supreme Court, but it's important to fight. Or are they better off saying, let's not use the filibuster now, because maybe if there's another vacancy and we use it, the politics of the situation will change so much the Republicans can't do the nuclear option then. Because it's also possible to think, look, the Republicans are going to use the nuclear option at any point. Let's go ahead and fight. You have to fight the battles when they come up. So I think there's that aspect. Second, I think you raised something very important about the confirmation hearings. The confirmation hearings in recent years have really become a sham. In January of 2006, I testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee against Samuel Alito's confirmation. At a break in the hearings, then Senator Joe Biden came up to me and said, you know this is all an exercise in kabuki theater. Those were his words. He said, everybody in this room knows that Samuel Alito is going to be a very conservative Supreme Court justice. The Republicans are pretending he has no ideology. The Democrats are trying to ask questions to trip him up, but he's too smart for that. I fear that what's going to happen starting March 20th is the Democrats are going to ask all sorts of hard questions, Neil Gorsuch, and he's going to say, I can't answer because it might come before the court. And then it's a meaningless check. And so I think the Democrats should say, unless he answers basic questions about his ideology and philosophy, they are going to vote against him, including if it means a filibuster. The final part of your question is about John Roberts. I think John Roberts is exactly the Chief Justice we would have imagined when he took the bench on the Supreme Court in September of 2005. He is overall very conservative. He's especially conservative on hot button issues involving race, gay rights, reproductive choice, separation of church and state, Second Amendment. 
The only exception to that is that John Roberts cast a vote to uphold the Affordable Care Act. But don't generalize from that one instance. Roberts is a very conservative justice, just as he's a very conservative judge. He is exactly who we had every reason to believe is going to be a Supreme Court justice. Okay, I have the opportunity of asking you the last question, and this one, sure. as you may know, is a plant. Um, this weekend is Stay Home and Read a Book Ball. What are you going to read? I'll answer if you'll answer. <laughs> What's the deal? <laughs> I recently read a book that I had never heard of before by Sinclair Lewis titled It Can't Happen Here. <laughs> it was written in 1935, and it talked about the possibility of a fascist beating Franklin Roosevelt in 1936. There's obviously many aspects of it that nothing to do with what can't now. But I found it quite chilling, and I hope not prescient. And um, I, I would recommend it to people. Good. In your book? Uh, I'm uh, just finishing a biography, new, soon to be published biography by John Farrell of Richard Nixon, um, which also has its uh, both uh, sort of uh, awful recollections and, and oddly sort of a little bit of nostalgia. He seems, he seems a little better uh, under the current circumstances, so I, I hope to finish it this weekend. Um, with that, I get the opportunity, first of all, to thank you all for coming, um, and second, uh, to thank you especially. Thank you. 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 Thank you.